and um, I'm very much delighted to speak today about um, behaviour change, which is one of my um, special interests. Um, and one of the things I want to focus on today was thinking about um, what, why is it so hard to change people's behaviour? And I want to think about the behaviour not only of our patients, but in terms of ourselves as healthcare professionals as well. Um, we, we all have kind of fixed ideas about how to think about changing people's behaviour, uh, and actually those ideas themselves can be as difficult to change as our patients' behaviour. So um, what I'm going to do is give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the challenges of behaviour change for patients and their families. I want to think about challenges for the dental team in terms of implementing behaviour change. And I want to look at some of the structural barriers, structural challenges that we have um, to changing behaviour and implementing behaviour change interventions. And I want to talk about some of the challenges that we are uh, as psychologists have, have set people who want to change behavior. Um, I think, you know, we're not innocent in this, psychologists, we, we have our part to play. And I want to conclude by kind of suggesting that one of the things that would be make it easier to change behavior would be to have a comprehensive approach to behavior change. And I'd like to outline where I think we are with that. So if we look at the first of these, um, in terms of challenges for patients and their families, um, these are widely discussed, um, most recently in the United Kingdom in our document, Delivering Better Oral Health, which has come out fairly recently, uh, and which we in the Alliance for a Cavity Free Future um, are, are a part of the implementation of that. So we're very pleased and proud to be a part of that. Um, and some uh, a systematic review by Kelly et al. in 2016, which identified some of the challenges that, that patients face in implementing behavior change. So the first and perhaps the most obvious is, is simply time and the conflict between implementing a new behavior or uh, taking time to do exercise or diet change, uh, whatever it is we want to want people to do. The conflict with other responsibilities that people might have such as family responsibilities, work, caring and so on. So time and conflict is, is often an issue for people. Access to resources to support behaviour change. Um, and that could be as simple as, as the resources that are required to, to uh, improve oral health. And if we think globally, the resources that we might need to um, improve our oral health are access to water, fluoridated toothpaste, uh, toothbrushes, um, the dental team. So actually those, res those resources are not universally accessible at this point in time. So actually that is a barrier for many people. And that of course relates to financial cost. Um, many changes could be low or no cost, but um, then there could be costs to uh, patients and their families for making uh, changes. Um, for example, in terms of diet, um, in general, um, high sugar calorie density foods represent almost a cost effective way to get calories in comparison to more healthy, less calorie dense foods such as fruits and vegetables. Um, so that's an important consideration for us. Entrenched values and behaviours. So, um, you know, we all live in, in within our own cultures. Uh, where certain kinds of patterns of eating, for example, um, or patterns of behaviour are, are quite culturally entrenched um, and valued, and making changes to those can be difficult. And then there can be restrictions in the physical environment in terms of, of how to um, change your behaviour, particularly if it's uh, things such as taking exercise. There could be problems about actually being able to do that in a safe manner in your physical environment. So many challenges for patients and families and things which, without a consideration of these, we are going to be ineffective. There is also challenges for the dental team. Um, uh, and again, a systematic review of these um, has looked at this. The first is the value placed on behaviour change activity, um, which is implied uh, often by the 
funding of behavior change interventions, which is something I'm going to talk about next in terms of structural um, barriers and challenges. So um, we tend to, the activities that we engage in as healthcare professionals tend to be valued both professionally in terms of, um, of what we think carries value, but also in terms of the way that they are financed. Uh, and currently I think that behavior change is not given the value in those kinds of senses um, that it might, that it probably requires. Second one is the dominance of knowledge-based approaches. So it is fairly universal, I think, that we, uh, we adopt uh, an approach to behavior change which is based upon provision of knowledge. It is assumed that it is essential uh, and necessary and often thought to be sufficient to change behavior simply to give knowledge. Uh, and psychologists have long known that knowledge is a very poor predictor of behavior change. Um, and so the dominance of those knowledge-based models rather than psychologically informed approaches is a challenge. Uh, a third thing is the perception of the appropriateness of, of asking people to change their behavior to the role of a healthcare professional. Um, to put it very simply, often healthcare professionals will think, patients don't want me to talk to them about their diet, or patients don't want me to talk to them about um, smoking cessation. It will disrupt the relationship I have with my patients. And by and large, surveys of patients find that um, patients would welcome opportunistic interventions for diet change or exercise um, or smoking cessation. So the barrier seems to be in the perceptions of, of individuals within their role, um, that they don't feel confident to talk about things which aren't necessarily perceived to be directly in their role as an oral health care professional. Um, it's kind of linked to the idea of knowledge-based approaches is the idea that much of behaviour change is common sense, uh, that there are, are things which... Um, which you know just makes sense to to that they're bound to make behavior change. The the obvious one uh, which I come across a lot is um, well, if we scare people with the consequences of of not changing their behavior, then they'll change their behavior. Um, and so for many years we had very frightening pictures on on cigarette packets because that was seen as being uh, a way to to scare people into behavior change. And by and large, the evidence suggests they were very ineffective. And we know from psychological studies that fear-based messages are very poor at changing um, behavior in a positive way. Uh, so they tend, fear-based messages tend not to drive behavior change. They tend to be very good at stopping, um, stopping people's behavior, uh, uh, putting people into a kind of freezing state, but they're not good at changing behavior. Um, the perception of outcomes, um, interestingly, if we take smoking cessation as a good example, if, if we did, if people do smoking cessation very, very well, and they give very good advice, very focused way, following all the guidance, they'll be successful possibly between three and 5% of the time. Now, there are very few interventions that we do um, as healthcare professionals that are 97% ineffective. But actually, um, that 3% is three to five percent is a maximal benefit uh, and you, over time and over many people it can make a real difference so, but actually for the healthcare professional who has that experience of making it an intervention and it being not effective more often than it is effective actually that could be a kind of very unrewarding way of behaving and therefore drives people to kind of give up i, I would imagine uh, the th other thing is that uh, healthcare teams like to have um, brief interventions. They tend to give one-off interventions, whereas that much of behaviour change requires a continuous ongoing intervention. Uh, and the final thing is that discipline-specific tasks tend to be prioritised and psychological interventions are perceived to be burdensome. They're difficult and challenging and often associated with um, a, a poorer outcome in terms of the behavior change. And so you can imagine that people would feel more rewarded by doing the things that, that are discipline specific and that they know they can achieve very successfully and they've been taught to do. Okay, 
There are structural challenges and um, the Policy Lab 3 held by the Alliance for a Cavity Free Future um, very much focused on looking at how we could create behaviour change. And again, the value of behaviour change, how do we fund a behaviour change model? Um, and uh, how do we not only fund it, but how do we ensure that if we do fund behaviour change that it actually happens? How do we monitor and evaluate behaviour change, which is less easy to count or evaluate than, say, caries, fillings, caries, uh, fillings performed, um, or uh, fluoride varnishes applied, and other things where it's actually quite easy to sort of count and evaluate and know we're doing it. Again, common sense models of behaviour change dominate the perceptions of outcomes and the continuity of intervention. So continuity um, behaviour change interventions where funded do tend to be brief and focused rather than allowing continuity. And um, if you're interested in reading more about the policy lab, um, the reference is here. Um, it's, it's well worth uh, reading and having a look at that. Okay. So in terms of psychology, what, what have we done? Well, I think don't think we've helped. Uh, the first thing is theoretical plurality. Up till about the early 2010s, um, there were 83 different psychological models of behavior change, 83 models to choose from. And those 83 models obviously had some overlap, but they contained something like 128 psychological constructs which could be changed, uh, could be important in behavior change. So for the person faced with the task of how to maximally and effectively um, change the behavior of their patients, this theoretical concept and, and, and complexity really um, was not particularly helpful, I would argue. Um, and the second related to that, though much of these theories overlapped, but use different terms for similar ideas. And that lack of a shared taxonomy, again, made it difficult. So you would have people saying, well, um, so a very simple one is, is people talk about motivational interviewing. Um, and actually, if you look at motivational interviewing in the terms of the literature of what people have done, they've used very different techniques under the same title of motivational interviewing. Um, and the third thing is that uh, just to, I, I am a psychologist, so I can, I feel justified in, uh, in saying this. Uh, psychologists love theory. Um, they're possibly weaker on the application of that theory, although we starting to develop that. Um, and we love to critique theory. Um, and so it can be quite confusing saying, well, we have this wonderful theory, but it has problems. Uh, so often we send very mixed messages. So uh, in order to kind of address that, what I'd like to do is talk about what I think is the common, the current dominant model of behavior change in psychology um, for health. Uh, and it's called COMB model combined with the theoretical domains framework. And I'll take you through the, the elements of this. So the first very simple element, which I hope many of you have seen before, is, is the COMB model, which suggests that in order to change behavior, we need to think about capability, motivation, and opportunity, these three elements. And there's kind of overlaps between them and they feed between each other, um, each feeds the other. But for a simple, uh, simple exposition today, I'm going to talk about these three separate elements um, uh, in turn. So if we look at these three elements, so capability um, has two aspects. It has uh, the physical skill to perform the behavior and physical skill could include strength, manual dexterity, um, uh, those kinds of physical capabilities. And the psychological um, capabilities, for example, knowledge. So uh, having the physical ability, the psychological ability to perform the behavior. Now, um, obviously in different groups, those might, might be more or less important. Um, so for example, um, I work in a department of uh, special care dentistry. And so we have individuals who, who, who lack 
um, the physical dexterity or physical ability to perform toothbrushing autonomously. And so they require some adaptations or support to do that. Um, and then there's knowledge. Now, the first thing I should note, uh, should note, which I like to always point out, is that knowledge here is in capability. It is not in motivation. And this goes back to a point that I was making earlier, which is that we often think that knowledge is motivating. Uh, was actually, it's, it's sort of a fundamental, it's more fundamental. It's more like you have to have a certain degree of knowledge and skill as the foundation of your behavior. Motivation is separate. Okay, I've mentioned motivation, so let's uh, talk about motivation. It has two aspects, uh, conscious and automatic motivation. So taking automatic motivation, that's really about the habitual um, automatic processes that uh, underline our behavior. So if you think about your everyday, a lot of your behavior is quite automatically driven. Um, so, you know, my, my waking up in the morning is triggered by the cue of an alarm clock. I then have a very pretty much fixed routine that I do um, in a certain order, so the, like brushing my teeth, having a shower, having breakfast, it's very driven by this chain of behaviours, quite automatic. Um, and then there's the kind of conscious processes, um, which generally the conscious processes are more manifest at work, where there's less of a habitual process, but I need to think about planning, making decisions, what happens when, what's going to happen next, arranging meetings, arranging work. Um, and so that's a kind of slightly different process uh, driving my behavior. So there's these two aspects, conscious and habitual. And often our oral aspects of our oral health beha related behaviors um, fall between these two things. So for me, toothbrushing is very habitual, um, as is incidental cleaning. It's something that happens uh, very routinely. Whereas the kind of food choice, thinking about um, decreasing sugar is more conscious at this point in time. And of course, what we'd really ideally like to do is think about transfer, transferring conscious planned behaviors into habitual behaviors so that food choice becomes much more habitual, much more um, every day. And so the behavior is built into what I do. Um, now, opportunity is related to the physical and social environment that helps to support you to undertake a behavior. Uh, so a very simple one, physical is about, for example, access. So if I, if I need the opportunity to go to a dentist or I need the opportunity to uh, use a fluoride toothpaste, then I need access to those things. Very simple. But then there's also the idea of the exposure to ideas. Does the environment, the social environment support the behavior? Um, two really simple examples. One is again from smoking. Um, when smoking was um, in certainly in the UK, um, banned in public places, um, that creates a social environment that makes it more difficult to engage in that behavior. Um, whereas um, you know, when when it's when smoking is is allowed in public spaces, it's obviously that that's, creates more opportunities for that. So we can control the behavior by controlling the environmental aspects. Okay, so we have these three elements: capability, opportunity, motivation. Um, and often, what we want to do is to change those elements and have techniques to create capability, create opportunities, create motivation. And that is where the uh, behavior change taxonomy um, comes into place, which is called the theoretical domain frameworks. Now, what happened, I mentioned earlier that there was 83 behavior change theories and 128 psychological constructs. And Susan Mickey and her colleagues um, went through a very rigorous process to take those, um, those constructs and reduce them into a, a common, um, uh, set of, of, of uh, taxonomy. And this is the theoretical domains framework, and it has 14 domains. Uh, the first of which is about knowledge, 
uh, so giving information related to behavior, teaching skills, social and professional roles, beliefs about capabilities, optimisms, beliefs about consequences. So these 14 domains are the things that we can do to change behavior. Um, so, for example, we can create intentions. So we can get people to make conscious decisions to perform a behavior or resolve to act in a certain way. Uh, we can set goals. Um, so obviously, we, if, you, if you've been thinking about capability, opportunity and motivation, thinking about this theoretical demands framework, you can see there's an overlap there, which is where we come to this aspect, which is the relationship between the COMB and the theoretical demands framework. So um, if we want to change cap psychological capability, that's about um, giving knowledge, teaching skills, uh, looking at memory and attention decision processes, getting people to understand about how they attend, how they remember things. How can they, uh, how can we improve their memory for, for certain health related information? For the physical, um, again, the skills training and behavioral regulation. So getting people to, to think about how they, uh, how they regulate their behavior. In terms of opportunity, we can look at social influences, environmental context and resources to change the physical environment. In motivation, um, we can think about looking at their professional role, their professional identity, make it more uh, broadening the professional role to include, for example, behavior change. Enhance their beliefs about capability. I mentioned earlier about healthcare professionals feeling that it's difficult, it's not really their role. Um, enhance their, belief, their beliefs about the consequences. So actually, while it may be that they're not being 100% effective all the time, the consequences of their behavior are very important. Enhancing their intentions to make these changes and setting themselves goals. And again, those kinds of processes are also important in, uh, in, in the automatic aspects of, mot uh, of motivation and reinforcement for making that behavior change. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I think we now are in the position of having uh, a universal model of behavior change, which we can adopt in dentistry um, and oral health in order to uh, inform training of healthcare professionals, but also the uh, commissioning of dental services to help us think about these are the things that we want people to do um, and we want to reward them for doing that and we want them to be an important part of their role because behavior change will fundamentally underpin uh, the prevention of oral disease, which is going to be critically important if we want to uh, achieve the goals of the Alliance for a cavity-free future, um, and we want to care for the oral health of populations in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>